This is a beefy little 8 inch subwoofer. Let's find out how low it can go. The goal is to build a home theater system for an apartment. Because it's home theater, you gotta hit those ultra low notes for the low frequency effects to make your movies come to life. But it's going in an apartment, so it can't be too loud. You don't wanna wake up your neighbors. Building an enclosure for a large subwoofer is actually pretty easy. That's because they need large boxes, and large boxes don't need long ports. But small subwoofers like this need small boxes, and small boxes need long ports. And it becomes it's really hard to get the port to fit inside of the box. But there's an easy fix. Just use one of these. This is a passive radiator. It's really easy for a big subwoofer to hit low notes, but small subwoofers struggle to hit the low notes. The trick is to use what's known as an extended base shelf. But there's a big problem with the extended base shelf. They're inefficient and you lose a lot of output. There's only one way to solve that problem. More power, baby. This is a 500 watt plate amp. I'm gonna throw all 500 watts at this little subwoofer. Keep Keep watching to find out how that works. This is the quick mock-up of the design. It features a downward firing subwoofer, a front firing passive radiator, and there'll be a second chamber in the back. That chamber is going to separate the plate amplifier from the subwoofer. This is home theater. Home theater speakers are basically furniture. With car audio, you can get away with building something ugly and closing the trunk and no one's gonna see it. Because of that, you've gotta take the speaker finishing up to the next level. And that's why I'm gonna use this really nice, expensive veneer. The goal here is to cover the front and the sides with one big long sheet of veneer. But veneer doesn't bend well around tight corners. To solve that problem, you need curves. There are a lot of ways you can do curves. You can use a massive round over bit. There's a method called kerfing, where you remove material so you can make bendable MDF. But I'm gonna try something I've never done before, something called stack fab. For that, you're gonna need, at the very least, a router. I happen to have a CNC machine, which can make cutting curves stupid easy. So let's give it a try. Since I've got a CNC machine, I'm gonna use it to cut out the rest of the parts. It's gonna give me the ability to cut some dados and rabbits into the material. That's gonna make it a lot easier to put the box together later on. You'll see what I mean in a bit. Okay, I've goofed. Sometimes things go wrong. If you're afraid to make mistakes, go buy a subwoofer, don't build it. Let's learn from the mistake. I was cutting out these triangles to use later in the build. You'll see what they're for if you keep watching. I was using double-sided tape to hold my workpiece down. This works great for large parts. If you're cutting out a bunch of small parts, you might miss. That part's not gonna be taped down. It could go flying. In this case, the CNC machine crashed and I almost did some serious damage. When I bought the CNC machine, I was really hoping it would free me from the router table. But what I've learned is that tabs are the best way to hold the workpiece and the best way to trim off those tabs is with a flush trim bit over on the router. The good news is I'm not wasting time cutting individual pieces on the router. The bad news is I'm wasting time cleaning them up on the router. But it was worth it because the fit is perfect. At this stage, you want to do a dry fit to make sure all of your parts are correct. Check out these curves. You can see in this shot that the curves have two quarter inch holes plus wings on the inside. You'll see what those are for in a bit, so keep watching. Make sure you inspect the corners. Sometimes the CNC is going to leave behind some material. The best way to remove it is with a chisel. In this shot here, you can see the triangles I cut earlier. These are the braces. I just got them stuck in place for now, but this is what they're going to look like after they're installed. Everything fits together as intended. That means you can grab some glue and start the assembly process. While I'm putting all that together, I want to give a great big shout out to all of my patrons, my $10 patrons. You can see their names right here on the screen. And a big bonus shout out to $25 and up patrons, Jonathan, Bo, Timothy, JD America, Joaquin, and Taylor. I could not afford to make these videos without the support of my patrons. Head over to patreon.com and sign up today.
because this is a down firing subwoofer, this box is going to need some feet. The front feet need to be curved to match the curve on the front of the enclosure. So it is back to the CNC machine. I wanted to show you the process of drilling out those quarter inch holes. I'm going to put some dowels in those holes. Those holes are for alignment. They're not for strength. To drill the holes, the CNC is in what we call pecking mode. The bit goes down about a quarter of an inch or more or less. You can control this yourself. Then it's going to retract to clear the dust out of the hole. And you can even see chunks of sawdust flying when the bit retracts. The front feet are stacked just like the curves on the front of the box. If you have any excess dowels sticking out of your feet, you can cut them off any way that you like. A jigsaw works fine, just be sure to sand them flat when you're done. The rear feet are just a pair of matching arcs. You can tack them into place. And don't forget the wood glue. The wood glue is important. You get your strength from the wood glue. Okay, the box is finished and I'm happy with the way it looks so far, but I don't want to put the veneer on yet because that veneer is kind of expensive. And if I've made a mistake in the design and assembly process, I want to know before I put the veneer on. This is one of those steps you really should not skip. I typically skip this step. Yes, you can just put the subwoofer down, drill some holes, drive some screws and be done. But that also increases the chance of messing something up. So you really should take the time to mark your hole locations. It's an extra step, it takes more time, but it's the right way to do things. And I really should try to do a better job of doing things right. The technically correct term for this is a pilot hole. If you're using plywood, you can sometimes get away without drilling pilot holes, but you should do it anyways. I've got some scrap material here. Let me show you what happens when you drill a pilot hole versus not drilling a pilot hole. To make life easier, I'm gonna do a little notch to get it started. So here I've got a pilot hole. Screw goes in, no worries, everything's fine here. No pilot hole. See that crack? I just realized some of you are gonna give me some crap because this hole right here is further from the corner right here. So I'm gonna spin this around and I'm gonna do this experiment again. And this time I'm putting the hole stupid close. All right, can y'all see that? There you go, no splitting, it's fine. Drill your pilot holes. Okay, I made another mistake, not really a mistake, but I've made my life more difficult. This is the plate amp for the project. Parts Express sent this out to me, so thanks to the guys at Parts Express for hooking me up. When it first arrived, I just went full send on the project. Yesterday, when I pulled it out of the box, I learned that it has a sealed back. So the amplifier itself is sitting in its own separate airspace, meaning that the divider I put inside this enclosure was a complete waste of time and money. What I should have done is opened up my parts, inspected them, measured them and subtracted this cube from my airspace. I'll keep that in mind the next time I build one of these. The amp itself has a feature that's really important and that's this EQ right here. It's not just your standard bass boost, it's a single band fully parametric equalizer. So there's the level control, that's the boost aspect. But you can also choose the frequency all the way down to 18, all the way up to 80, and then you can change the bandwidth. That's how wide the boost is. This is really handy because you can use it to remove peaks and valleys. When using an EQ, the rule is to cut first. You use boost as a last resort. So let's say that we have some peak at 45 hertz. We can adjust this to 45 hertz 
and then adjust that bandwidth. Turn it up really high if you want to cut everything from 40 to 50 hertz. Turn it down low if you just want to target it right at 45 hertz. Then you can cut that peak out using the level control and pull that down. If you don't want to use the EQ, set it to zero and it won't cut or boost anything. Even though I don't need this separate air chamber back here, I'm glad I have it. If my amp were to die, I could replace it with a different amplifier. It's a dual two ohm subwoofer, so we're gonna wire it in series to get a four ohm load at the amp. So we're gonna grab the negative terminal on this side and run it to the positive terminal on this side. If you're curious as to how to do the math for that, I've got a calculator on my website. I'll be sure to give you a link to that. In case I missed it earlier, these are the triangles I cut on the CNC. And I'm just using them as bracing. They're just kind of random locations throughout the enclosure. I don't think I got that on film. You wanna use a crisscross pattern? Just like if you were tightening down a car tire. The amplifier came with quick disconnects. I'm not a fan of quick disconnects. They never seem to be the right size. So I just crimped on some ring terminals and I'll bolt those down. This right here is a passive radiator. A passive radiator is basically a complicated port where the size of the cone is the port opening. So basically we're dealing with a 12 inch port here, which seems like a lot for an eight inch subwoofer, but it is what it is. To tune the passive radiator, you add mass to it. That's the functional equivalent of making a port longer. But okay, how do you add mass to it? That's tricky. Not really, because there is a screw on the back of the passive radiator, and they typically will ship with some weights. These are supposed to be 75 gram weights, and as best I can tell, I'm gonna need four of them. 75 grams is about two and two thirds of an ounce in freedom units. This is one of those nylock nuts that won't back out. That's handy. I have no idea what the weight of the nut is, so I might be putting too much weight on this. If this isn't tight, those weights will rattle. <laughs> You'll hear them. Oh, it's gonna take a while. Should've used a power tool for this. There we go. That is the tuning that the design calls for. If I wanna go lower, I have another 75 gram weight. After that, I'll have to scramble to find some weights. <laughs> because that's the only one I've got now. Let's install it and see how it sounds. Okay, so it's doing what I want it to do. It's not terribly loud and it can hit those low notes. But did you notice a weird sound? You can really hear it at higher excursion. It almost sound like paper flapping in the wind. That's an air leak. There's an air leak somewhere in this box. Let's take a look at it and see if we can find the problem. Not sure how well you can see that, but there it is right there. I got an air leak right there. So my cutout was a tad bit undersized. I always say you should do a test fit on your baffles before you start assembling things. I didn't do that this time. I didn't think I needed to. I had the measurements from the manual. I had a CNC machine. That just goes to show you, you always do a test fit. There's always just a little bit of variance in the manufacturing process. Inches, it just is what it is. This is an easy fix. I'm gonna cut a ring that's about an eighth of an inch larger than the cutout, tape that ring down, grab a small router, and make a hole that's just a bit bigger than my existing speaker cutout. I know it looks like I'm making a lot of mistakes, but not really. What you're seeing is the active problem solving process that every DIYer has to go through on every DIY project. As you're working, you're constantly going to find or even create little problems that have to be solved. And you need to see me making those mistakes and solving those problems so you could understand that setbacks are normal. You've just got to power through them. The obstacle is the way.
All right, it should be fixed now. Why don't we see how much abuse this little subwoofer can take? Well, the sub is definitely blown and I don't have another sub, but that's the end of the video. I'll fix it in the next one.